across America, incredibly talented artisans make amazing objects the old-fashioned way, by hand. This episode of Handcrafted America is a celebration of the use we like of a tree. Don't break, don't break. This artisan in Lapel, Indiana, twists and bends willow until it becomes furniture. If you put love into something, it shows. In Colorado ski country, this man handcrafts skis in a surprisingly complicated process. I had no idea that all of this was in a ski. After years of woodworking, this Arkansas-based father and son created a one-of-a-kind style of cutting boards. I'm trying to make something unique and different. Let the celebration begin. Just don't stop. Whatever you do, just keep going. All right. Thanks to our next artisan, I can choose to sit and relax near some of my favorite trees or on one. In Lapel, Indiana, population 2068, furniture maker Greg Adams knows how to turn willow trees into treasure. At his shop on Main Street, nearly everything is created out of bountiful, beautiful willow. I love working with willow because it's so flexible, it has a nice color, it smells good. I just love everything about it. Greg creates one-of-a-kind furniture out of nothing but black willow saplings and nails. I feel very fortunate to be able to do something that I love and be paid for it because if you put love into something, it shows. It really does show. These are crick willows here. That's what these are. Oh. You know, this is where the good stuff is. Oh, so this is what you use? Yes. It's weird. It looks a little bit like bamboo. Kinda. It does. Now, what we want, straight and tall. Most of the willow Greg gathers from his friend's property would be cut down and cleared away. Instead, Greg turns it into beautiful furniture. See how these are nice and straight? We'll be using these for the frame. And then those over there, see how tall and thin they are? Yeah. We'll be using those for bendable parts around the back. You know, say like this. Wow. See how flexible? Yeah. Let's go make a chair. These are ones I've cut and bundled up. Greg is able to harvest willow in all seasons. In the wintertime, it'll stay green a lot longer because I leave it outside. It's like having it in the freezer. In the summer, it dries out, and after maybe a week, it's too brittle. Greg creates the love seat frame using larger pieces of older wood. Greg. This is the completed frame. Sturdy. It's so, I can't believe just with nails. See how the angles are not square? Yeah. See how that's kind of this way and that uh -huh. way? Yeah. That's what makes it strong. That's incredible. I learned that from my dad. Greg comes from a long line of woodworkers. His father was a skilled carpenter. His grandfather ran a sawmill. And his great grandfather started a barrel factory in the 1800s. Using more pliable, younger wood, Greg creates the arms for the chair. And this goes under here, and then I bend it like this, very slowly, carefully put it under there. And why do you want to bend it slowly? Because otherwise it'll snap. It will snap. I tell you, that wood is Don't hard. Don't it all the way in. Huh? I'm just kidding. What? <laughs> These are stainless steel ring shank nails. These are used for making wooden uh, saltwater docks. They're the best nails available. 20 years from now, if you burn up this love seat, the nails would look just like this. Greg will use about 500 nails in this one chair. That's going to bend? What we do sometimes is to warm it up a little bit, is to do this. Now let me let you do that very carefully. All right. There you go. Gradually. Don't break. Don't break. There Don't you go. break. There you go. You got it. These are so flexible, I just cut them the other day, so they're, very, they're good to go. Sometimes when they're getting a little dry and on the, the end of their life cycle, why that's a little tougher. But, and if it does snap it, just jump back real fast. <laughs> What's your favorite thing to make? Whatever I'm working on at the time. These are nice because I've done so many of them, I, I know how to do it, I feel really competent. All right, now next thing, 
is to put the things around this one. Okay, the arch on the back. Yeah. And this is all the same uh, all the kind same. of willow? This is just uh, younger. This is how old, this willow? About three years. You can see this is one, one year, and here's another year, so oh. there's the third year. The no, that's called a node. A node, so you count the nodes. That's how I know them. <laughs> Greg hammers two long willow pieces to either side of the chair. Magic part. Grab it up as high as you can, slowly, carefully bend it toward me. Slowly. All right. Now I'll catch this one and you catch this one. All right. I can't believe that one little nail right there uh -huh. held it. It's because this here pushes against that, this pushes against that. This pushes against that, so it's all organic. When I take this home and I've had it for five years, will any of these ever snap? No. Is there a way to care for it? No. Nothing? Um, you just need to keep it out of the weather. I still go by places where people have it on their porch that I made 25 years ago. Really? Mm -hmm. The hardest thing sometimes is to get that so it looks right. So I'll take your judgment. That on. Looks what do you think? Perfect. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? That looks amazing. This love seat costs around $400. It's the perfect way to bring the nature around you right into your home. Trimming each piece to size as he goes, Greg adds long willow pieces for the back and seat of the chair. He levels the legs with a handsaw. Shall we? Does it fit? It fits. Everything's perfect, I think. <sighs> yeah. This is nice. It's sturdy. It's beautiful. It's one of a kind, it's handcrafted. You know where I see this? Where? On my porch. How'd I know you were gonna say that? <laughs>
But what that does is it opens up the pores on the plastic and allows it to accept the bond better. Next, he trims and attaches the sidewalls and the tip fill to the core with fiberglass tape. And finally, we add carbon fiber to the center of the core over the bamboo. The fiber will actually be contracting, whereas the fiberglass actually elongates. So as you're adding flex to your skis, these two different composite elements are trying to snap that ski back home. It makes our skis really lightweight and really fun and reactive. There you go. Looks like you've done plenty of bedazzling in your time. Don't tell anybody that. Now that the core is ready to go, we head to the milling machine to cut the footprint for the base of the skis. Steel edges are bent in a jig and attached 360 degrees around the base. Mike is one of only a few ski makers who does this by hand. Once the edges are done, we add the Folsom logo to the bottom of the base using a die cutter. We can just slap down a simple piece of tape just to make sure that nothing gets dislodged as we go to the press cycle. What's next? Next, we're going to be getting ready to lay up the ski. Mike has been hinting at adding a special little touch to my skis. The big reveal! The big yes. reveal, here it goes. Denver, Colorado, where pro skier turned ski maker Mike McCabe is making me a custom pair of skis. We've got a lot of the ingredients put together, but before we can move on, Mike's got a special surprise for me. The big reveal! The big yes. reveal, here it goes. Ah! Oh my gosh, that's so cool! My design isn't cool for long. It gets heated to 350 degrees in a press, and using a process called dye sublimation, it actually becomes a part of my skis. And what it does is takes the ink, superheats it, and actually transfers it into this material. So this is the underside of the top sheet, so now this is actually the top side, so you can see everything looked reversed. And then there's actually a protective tape that's just over the top of this that stays there. So that's the best part about this whole thing is pulling that tape off and seeing that beautiful custom ski that we've built. All right, so what we're gonna be doing next is actually laying up the ski. Once we mix our resin and hardener, we roughly have about 25 minutes to get this whole thing fully saturated, placed into this cassette in order, and then placed into this uh, press under heat and pressure. Okay, so we got lots to do. Yeah. You ready? Start your engines. Mike starts with a custom mix of resin and hardener. So then our first step is going to be pre-saturating all of our composites. Once the fiberglass is done, we move to the custom mold, or cassette, and saturate the base, the first layer in our ski sandwich. Nice job, actually. Right? I didn't even have to touch that up. The next layer is the fiberglass we pre-saturated. We add more resin to any dry spots and some more rubber where the skis hit hard stuff like rocks. My experience is, has taught me where, where you're impacting rocks the most, uh -huh. and just generally understanding what's happening to those skis while I'm skiing. Laying up that core by hand is what makes Folsom Ski so strong and durable. So now we're ready to pick up our whole core and drop that into the cassette over here. So once we know everything's sitting in there nice, then we're ready to do the top side saturation. Now Let me just say that I had no idea that all of this was in a ski. There's a lot of effort that goes into yeah. it. It's about 10 hours per pair. Next we're ready to add the graphic layer. This is one of the coolest things I've ever done. Now this piece just goes right over the top of the ski to create our final piece of our sandwich. And then what we do, we kind of tack everything together so that we can place it into this press. So now you can just feel the, the heat billowing off this thing, the right? heat? Yeah. I'm nervous, we have like three minutes. Three minutes left, folks. Our whole cassette drops right in here. One minute and 45 seconds. Okay, now we're dropping the top chassis back down. Boom, and apply the pressure. And now that bladder just fills up and creates about 20,000 pounds of downward force, just squeezing everything together. And then 25 minutes later, 
we will have our pressed ski. After they come out of the press and cool, the skis are ready for finishing. Excess epoxy and material, or flashing, is trimmed from the top and bottom with a jigsaw. Mike gives the sidewalls a final polish on the grinding belt, and then it's on to the grinding wheel. So what this is is a big flat stone that has a structure in it to add that final structure here. Rock and roll! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Just when I thought these skis couldn't get any more handmade, Mike hand tunes them with diamond stone, hand waxes them with an iron, gotta love a guy who irons, then buffs the sidewalls on the bottom and scrapes away the excess wax. After they're sent off for bindings, these skis are gonna be crazy fast. He gives them a final buff and shine, and then it's time to peel off that tape. A pair of Folsom custom skis cost around $900. That price not only buys you a cool, durable pair of skis, but you're also buying Mike's experience as a skier. So let's look at these bad boys. Oh yeah. Ah! Beautiful. First of all, this has been an epic adventure with you making these skis. This is incredible. I cannot wait to take these down the mountain. What's better than a new pair of handcrafted skis? Handcrafted America skis, like these. There's a father-son team in Arkansas who have, shall we say, unusual methods of making their beautiful cutting boards. Yeah, this looks like a perfectly good cutting board. Let's chop it into pieces. A cutting board is definitely a great kitchen tool, but not necessarily something you want to hang on your wall, right? Or is it? In the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas, craftsmen flock to this tiny town of Timbo and its backdrop of plentiful Ozark trees. Local woodworker Paul Gillum and Paul Jr. are creating cutting boards from local hardwoods that have top chefs, weekend cooks, and art collectors clamoring for their one-of-a-kind designs. Paul, what makes you different in the cutting board world? <laughs> well, for most part, is probably bending the curved lines. Wow. What we'll do is take thin strips of another type of wood and actually laminate that in between the, the seams of the other wood. I'm trying to make something unique and different. It's functional art. It's beautiful. The Pauls are going to show me how they make these incredible boards, and the process begins with a plank of wood. We're going to work with walnut today. Walnut, and I know we're in the Ozarks, so is this a common wood here? Yes, it is. Go ahead. The board has to be cut into 17-inch lengths. Cut off. Good job. Okay, we'll move to the next stage. We head to the planer, then move on to the sander. This okay. is the best way to sand ever. Paul, I'm coming in hot. Okay. That's work for us to do. Paul Sr. and I need to turn the plank into 12 equal size strips. Like this. Right. I got it. There we go. Okay. There we go. So, what we're going to do is we're going to glue this together. Why cut the plank into strips and then glue them back together? A single plank of wood warps over time. This process drastically reduces that warping. It looks okay. like a cake. And done. A non-toxic glue secures the strips. Okay. Clamps tighten them up, and then Paul Jr. uses a crab mallet to flatten out the boards. What we'll do is put the third one in the middle, okay. just keep it from coming apart, and there we do. And how long is this going to sit? 24 hours. Once the strips have dried into a block, we start working on the Gillum signature look. All right, Big Paul. What are we going to do right now? What we're going to do now is we're going to draw a pattern on here so we can cut it out on the bandsaw. Just, just freehand it, it? Yeah, just freehand it. Is that what it. you guys do? That's what we do. It seems like this father and son have really perfected their methods. What does it feel like to you? Because not every parent gets to work with their child. That's probably the best feeling in the world. I mean, I know I'm lucky. I really do. I, I understand that. And 99% of the time we get along, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, this looks like a perfectly good cutting board. Let's chop it into pieces. Just don't stop. Whatever you do, just keep going. Okay. This step right here is what makes Gillum's cutting boards completely unique. 
The size and the shape of the blocks I'm cutting will create those cool lines and designs. We have our board. It doesn't look like a cutting board anymore, but nope. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to fix that. Next, thin strips of maple will be used to add the Gillum's cutting edge detail. Here's the design you cut. Now all we're going to do is pull this back apart, put these thin strips in between. And why are we using maple? Maple bends easy. Now, how much would this board cost? This one roughly about 150 Once glued, the board's set for another 24 hours. Then it's run through a sander. A juice tray is cut with a router. We brand every piece and it says Blue Mountain Woodworks, Timbo, Arkansas. Beautiful. Finally, an FDA approved citrus infused oil brings out the lush colorings of the wood. Pretty, pretty, pretty stuff, Junior. The mighty tree is a force to be reckoned with, but then again, so are these artisans. When you're doing handcrafted stuff, you do sacrifice your hands. my thing. Most people would actually be wearing gloves to handle this, but since I do this all the time, I can't really feel the heat anymore. <laughs> I enjoy making things with my hands, mainly because when I'm done, it's something I can look at to know I made it. And what he makes, what all of these artisans make, is every bit as beautiful as the trees they're made from.